Welcome everyone to So Very Wrong About Games, a board gaming podcast about board games and plague carts. I'm here with my good friend, Mark. How are you this week, Mark? This is the plague cart. We are simultaneously in the plague cart and driving the plague cart. That's right. We are plague cart. Yes. All right. We are so sick. Between the two of us, we are so ill that I, well, I'm no epidemiologist. I'm no expert on these things. It is possible that we can, will give you an ear infection over the course of this episode. I wouldn't. Yeah, but not liable in any way. By downloading this episode, you actually sign a general waiver. And that is why you might, when you're coming home one day, find me rifling through your stuff. But nobody reads the end user license agreement anymore. So this episode will be abridged. We are going to cut off the end bit, slap, cut off, scraped into the garbage. We're going to talk about the Eurus. We're going to talk about the games we played this week. And then we're going to finish with the news. And then that will be all. Yes, we are deciding to marshal our wrongness. We will be less wrong this week, just to be more wrong overall. Because 10 years from now, something's going to come out and be like, I want to hear Mark and Walker be wrong about this thing. And that's why we have to pace ourselves when we're this sick. And then during the episode, you'll hear me sort of trail off to silence. And then be back at full volume. That was the edit cut of me coughing out <laughs> half a lung. Just so you know. I don't think you have half a lung left, Walker. So let us begin with the as yet unnamed retrospective intro segment, the Aurus. I was looking. We're, like It's been so long ago. Were we reviewing food? <laughs> the beefiest of games. Stroganoff by Andreas Stedding. And this is very much a game that has remained in our collections and remains in sort of a, a background rotation. Always happy to play. I would say that this is probably my second favorite Andreas Stedding after Hansa Teutonica. There's a, for me though, there's a considerable gulf between Hansa Teutonica and Stroganoff. That's not really a ding on Stroganoff. That's more my enthusiasm for Hansa Teutonica. You probably though, it's, it's a little closer competition between Stroganoff and Gugong, I would wager. Yes. I'm less fond of Gugong than you are. Uh, Stroganoff, since its release, we've played a number of times, and it's been expanded. And my understanding is, this may be a little bit of an exaggeration, but that Game Brewer has released 17 different component upgrade packs in waves for, for Stroganoff. Yeah, people didn't like what came with the deluxe set when it got released from the crowdfunding. So they said, well, we have this expansion, and if you pledge for this, then for $5, we upgrade everything again. I... I'm going to be surprised what I see in the box. It's wild. I think that publishers need to stop using the word deluxe. I think that what they should really start using is words like improved. Because then when somebody says, this isn't, like, where are the metal coins? This isn't five times as thick as my thumb. It's like, well, look, we never said it was going to be deluxe. We just said it was going to be better than what other people were going to get, be getting, right? I, I see this all the time. People are like, look, deluxe means triple layer boards a 53-pound box, and a metal start player marker. And look, if that's what you want, and if that's what you're promised, that's what you're entitled to, right? And if you want to pay for that and you want to get that, that's fine. It's just Spe expectations are being generated. I'm going to say, speaking of paying for and getting, <laughs> the people that have paid, I guess this is news, but whatever, people that have paid four times what the game is about for inventors have now received their copy because they were airshipped from the factory to their house and so now they get to play, and we'll get it later on in the year. Stroganov. No. Yeah, Stroganov it remains slightly differentiated from a lot of Euros. The, the whole action selection element is is kind of clever and, and unique. Again, not as clever and unique as Hansa Teutonica is. Relatively clean. Again, not as clean. Andrea Stedding is a solid Euro designer, and I very much appreciate going back to Stroganov every time we do. And for what it's worth, just, just, just for the, the record, I have zero complaints about the Stroganov components. Uh, but then again, I only ever got the retail version and was only ever expecting the retail version. So I cannot comment on, on miscommunication and false expectations. Yeah, I never have any problems with it. As long as they're intact, I'm happy. Fair enough. And that is the as yet unnamed retrospective intro segment, the Euros Stroganoff by Andres Dreas Stedding. And now on to the games we played last week. Walker, what did you play last week? Mark, we've got a review copy of a game called Hissy Fit. This is a cooperative deck game. That's my life story. Just so you're trying to get the cat into the carrier because it's time to get to the vet. And so there's multiple ways you can lose because uh, you're going to be flipping up cards, cat cards, and they could have scratches on them or they could have hissy fits on them. And there are nine hissy fit cards in the deck. So, you know, when you get to nine, you're going to lose because there's no way to deny it. But it's in groups of three. And every time you get three, you have to flip over the card and you have to do what it says on the back. It could be all sorts of different things. 
And then you get scratches as well. And there's ways to, you know, heal yourself. And then the cards have sort of like little tasks you have to do. Either the angry cat or the calm cat or any of those different symbols. And then from the player deck, you're drawing all these cards and you're playing to get rid of these hissy fit cards before they build up too much. Because they have an ongoing effect as well if you don't get rid of them. So you're going back and forth and the gist of the game is deciding on how to spend your two actions. Because you're either playing the cards or you're drawing more cards or you're forfeiting both actions to draw three cards. So it's just sort of this action efficiency that you're trying to f figure out. And for the time it takes and for the amount that you're doing, I think it's a great little game. Do the cats have names? Yes. And they're the some of the pictures are adorable. Some of the pictures are hilarious. I, I, I like very much almost everything about this game, especially the time it takes to play, which is very short. And that's Hissy Fit. This is designed by Levy Robinson and Chris Stone. Uh, Chris Stone, is, I th believe, is also the, the publisher because it comes out by Stone Age Distractions. And it was a review copy that we got. I believe it, uh, it was a crowdfunding uh, adventure that they did and it's fulfilling. So I'm sure, hopefully, we'll see it in retail and people will be able to get to play it. So my week was one of infection and solitude in equal measure. And so all of my games for this week are solo games, either solo variants of existing games or games that are explicitly solo. The first one being finished with the exclamation point. That's about as much enthusiasm and, and as much volume as I can uh, as I can marshal in my current diminished state. Poor exclamation point. Yes. All the others got so much attention. <laughs> this one. <laughs> this is a solitaire game by Friedman Fries, published, of course, by 2F Spiel. It's important to remember that Friedman Fries, in some ways, uh, kind of presaged or was ahead of the time on the great solo games explosion. Uh, Finished was uh, very much of its time, but before that he published a solitaire card game called Friday, which I know you've played before, and I find Friday devilishly clever and very interesting, and as I say, it was kind of ahead of its time. Finished, on the other hand, uh, the theming is simultaneously aggressively prosaic and very delightful. It's prosaic because it's about someone trying to finish their data entry tasks. It is literally about a woman working an office job who needs to organize and collate data. And she is fueled in equal measure by two fundamental elements, caffeine and candy. I can relate to half of that. Uh, because I've never specifically the, the caffeine is, is delivered by a coffee. Uh, I do not enjoy coffee ever since I became acquainted with Dr. Steve's caffeine melts. I nonetheless indulge in caffeine, uh, but being fueled by candy is absolutely a sentiment that I can respect. However, the actual gameplay, I've struggled to really engage with finished in a substantive way because I keep bouncing off of it because I always end up feeling like perhaps in vague evocation of the thematic elements that I'm just shuffling cards around. Round. Ultimately, your decision points in Finished are about deciding to trigger various powers on cards that allow you subtle rearrangement abilities. Because as I say, the goal is to take a randomized deck of cards from 1 to 47 and put them all in order. It's kind of like Solitaire, the, the 52 card traditional card game, in that once a card that is next in sequence comes up, you put it off into the score pile and you start off with the one and then you try to score the two and the three, etc., etc. And organizing things gets you towards that. And so far, so good. Like that in and of itself, structurally, I don't really have a serious problem with. Uh, my problem are twofold. One of them is that I don't find the special abilities particularly interesting nor transparent in terms of how you get to the end, end task. I think this is partially me not having internalized the puzzle. Even when I get the sense that I'm making progress, I'm not always entirely certain how I'm getting there. Now, one thing that I have internalized is that you do want to have as many cards as possible out in front of you at a time. You turn over three at a time, and the only time you're able to rearrange cards at will is once the cards in front of you for a given quote-unquote turn go away. So if you have three, the standard three cards and you, you draw the 18, the 42, and the six, it's like, okay, well, you can put the six in front of the 18 and the 18 in front of the, or whatever, whatever the case may be. But if you have a whole bunch more cards, well, then that gives you a little bit more fine grain sequencing available. Because if you sequence the 42 and then the next card you draw is the eight, eh, not so hot. But if you have the eight as part of the initial hand, you can put the six next to the eight and then you're getting somewhere. That part I understand, but there's a whole bunch of other card manipulation things, which leads me directly to the second problem. At the end of the day, the fundamental rhythm of finished ultimately becomes a lot about just shuffling cards around in an unsatisfying way, particularly because you can only start triggering the special powers by spending candy. 
And I find myself running out of candy relatively quickly because that's how you interact with the game, right? So if you don't have candy, all you're doing is you're flipping over three cards, then they go into the past. The past can only have three cards in it. So what I'm doing is I'm pulling over three cards, putting these other three cards at the bottom of the deck, shuffling out, pulling over three cards, rearranging them slightly, three cards go in, three cards at the bottom of the deck, three cards out, over and over and over again, a certain number of times through the deck. And the amount of time that I spend making decisions, the amount of time that I spend just manipulating cards in front of me, I find the ratio way off. And so ultimately, especially, especially when compared to even something by the same designer in the same idiom in the same genre like Friday, I just find finished ultimately disengaging. Now, this is despite the fact that I find so much about the presentation charming. The, the idea of these lovely wooden bits of coffee cups and, and bits of candy. If you complete successfully complete the game, or even regardless of how far you get, it forms a flipbook walker. The drawings on the cards form a flipbook. Now, granted, it's a flipbook of a, of a woman drinking coffee at her desk as she's manipulating data. Gotcha. But nonetheless, that's really cool. Ultimately, I don't think I'm going to be going back to finish. I've given it a number of tries. I haven't really internalized the puzzle insofar as I understand what I'm going to be doing with the puzzle. I still feel like I'm just moving cards around for very little effect. So I would rather just turn to other things by Friedman Freeze in the same broad wheelhouse. Now, I know that there is a shmup-themed solo game that Friedman Freeze has designed that gets even less love than Finished and Friday. And eh, I'd give that one a shot because I really like the theming. And Friedman Freeze is always at least an interesting designer, but nonetheless, here we are. That is finished. All right, I'd like to talk about City of the Living. This is a uh, Reiner Knizia uh, reskin. Believe it or not, I, I don't think we ever played any of those. <laughs> but anyway, it's a Reiner Knizia game that you have two actions, also surprising. And it's zombie-themed. So Trick or Street Studios was nice enough to send this with to me, as well as Unchained, that card game that's very much like Nightfall. What you're doing in City of the Living is that you're just, it's fairly heads down. There's sort of tiles out on the board that everyone can buy. So it's sort of, I got that before you did. But otherwise, you're trying to maximize your board. There are sort of seven rounds and every, every round there are five tiles that are going to come up that, and every tile that someone draws on your turn, you draw a tile and one of the icons will be circled. And so you're going to be doing something on your board. And so there's one of every of the five things you're going to do. So every round, you're going to do one of these five things. Three of them is just more resources. Two of them is comparing, you know, check marks to X's or locks to unlock. So you're, you're sort of trying to maximize your board. And I played it solo and two player. The solo part wasn't that great, but playing with two player was a little more interesting. Seeing what your opponent was doing, trying to get to the tiles before they did. You can sort of risk and spend a bunch of resources and, and get a tile further up the track. I just found it very interesting. Really? I played the original game of, of which this is a Reese game, namely Prosperity, when it came out. And I find Prosperity simultaneously uh, solid and unremarkable on the one hand, and on the other, uh, very disappointing. It was very disappointing partially because it was marketed as Reiner Knizia's, you know, return to heavy-ish euros. Every few years... Some publisher decides to pitch Reiner Knizia's next project is, remember those heavier Euro games he did 20 years ago? He's gone back to that style. It's like, he's not going, he, he, he hasn't gone, he, he's not going to. He doesn't do that. He doesn't do that anymore. And that, you know what? That's okay. People get to do what they want. I talked about this in Bloat, uh, it, it, under the, uh, under the rubric actually of T-Pain covering war pigs. Like every once in a while, that person is going to do that thing that you want them to do, but the rest of the time, they're not going to do the thing you want to do, and that's fine. They're going to do the thing that they want to do. Rennick he doesn't want to cover war pigs all the time. He wants to, he wants to do the heavily auto-tuned voice stuff that he now does, and that's okay. We just have to accept that. I'm now fully mixing the metaphor. Yeah, Prosperity was fine. It was okay. I'm surprised you, you, you enjoyed it as much as you did. I, I'm, I'd be curious to see if anything has been changed. I'll definitely look over the rules at the very least, but it was, uh, solid but uninspired in my recollection what i really liked is the flow you have your two actions and they're very simple actions maybe get some resources buy the tile go up on this track so you get through those actions very quickly next player flips over the tile you get your stuff and it goes on from there and you only have to go through seven rounds so it goes really quickly so that's what i like about it and this is city of the living by reiner knizia published by trick-or-treat studios and it was a review copy sent to us
I finally got to try Legacy of You. This is something I've been meaning to try ever since it came out last year. Legacy of You is a solo game designed by Shem Phillips at Garpel Games. I, I have a Legacy? No, no, this is Legacy. It's not Legacy of, of Walker. It's Legacy of Mark. Oh, of you. Uh, yeah, exactly. Oh, okay. I'm glad you understand. All right. Legacy of You is a game that comes up frequently in conversation, especially for people who are who are not particularly enthusiastic about Shem Phillips and Garpel Games' broader output. Frequently, it's okay. So, so profession of the place name didn't work out for you, but hey, have you tried Legacy of You? So, I felt the the the, the need to give it a shot, and it's really quite impressive. A lot of solitaire Euro games are just the solitaire mode of existing Euro games, and to for for, for better or worse. There are two dominant idioms of solitaire Euro games, not over, not universally, but overwhelmingly. One of them is the David Tertze. So you've learned how to play the game. Now learn how to do the solo mode. Here's your 20 page solo mode rulebook version. That I often find to be not worth the effort. The other mode is the score attack mode, the sort of Agricola mode. It's like, oh, well, the solo mode works more or less the same way as, as the multiplayer mode. But uh, here's your score threshold. See if you can beat it. Shrug. And that's fine. I'm perfectly willing to do that. And I've, I've, I've soloed my share of Uwe Rosenberg worker placement games as a specific example. But what I really like is a slightly more focused, dedicated experience. And on occasion, you get solo modes that do that. For example, just having picked on David Tertze, the solo mode of Anacrity base game works like that swimmingly. You get a lovely little AI that's easy to execute. Here in Legacy of You, it is very much a resource conversion efficiency Euro game, and you're basically pulled in three different directions. One of them is infrastructure. You need to be able to build up infrastructure, but it's a relatively short-scaled game, so the, the it, it's not the kind of thing where you're going to be spending a lot of time building up. You need to be able to address your immediate-term needs, and to that end, there are two additional pressures. One of them is you need to build these canals and these dams in order to deal with this massive flood and the other that you need to deal with is there are these barbarians who keep barbaring, and I don't know why. They, they show up and they want all my people and all my sheep. And I don't, look, I'm running out of both. Greedy. That's just exactly right. And I lost my first playing, which is great. It is designed around the idea of a sort of difficulty rubber banding. If you win games, harder cards enter the system. If you lose games, easier cards into the system. And ultimately, it is the end of a seven-game campaign that determines ultimately whether you win or lose. And the rulebook is very clear about this. Like, look, don't sweat it if you lose your first couple games. Comma, you loser. Uh, that's what the internet is for. The internet people are going to show up and say, no wonder you couldn't win the game. Lol, you you, you can barely win regicide. Lol. Uh, that is what I mean. Please feel free to leave that comment exactly in your email to support at aircanada.ca. I thoroughly enjoyed it. It's got a very, very simple, straightforward, uh, card-driven system. Every turn, you're going to get a certain number of cards. That's both a benefit and the burden, because the more cards you go through, the faster the flood goes. I guess it's chasing people, whatever. You have to kind of hand wave that part. And there are a variety of different ways you can use cards, and mostly I felt that the pressure was to get more cards into your system. There's a, a weak sort of deck-building element, as well as use your cards to get more income. That requires you to build buildings. Anyway, as I say, lots of different trade-offs for very, very scarce resources, and a very sort of immediate visceral impact of barbarians and, and the flood coming after you. It's got a, a, a very well-done insert, which I mentioned because it's really going to facilitate quick setup and quick teardown. I really like how focused overall Legacy of You is. Not only is it a relatively rules-light experience, so you can remember how the systems work and come back to it, but it's also a relatively quick playing time. We're talking about 45 minutes or so, and for a resource management euro, that's really good. And everything is designed to be able to make sure that you can come back and complete the campaign in a relatively short amount of time without breaking the bank or too much of a time commitment. So I'm definitely going to go back to Legacy of You. I'm, I'm absolutely going to play, at, at the very least, the second scenario. I'm probably going to finish the entire campaign. I might actually knock out a couple sessions in sequence over the course of the coming week as I maintain my isolation in a period of profound suffering. Like we do with orphans. No, oh. no. That we do not do that with orphans, Walker. Oh. Have you read our editorial policy about orphans? The orphaned Gibbons were at great pains to write it up. Gotcha. So, yeah, I'm a big fan. Uh, this isn't necessarily uh, converting me uh, to the, uh, the, the the Church of Shem Phelps, but this is absolutely, I think, the strongest work of his that I've that I have yet tried. It is extraordinarily well done in terms of solo Euro resource management games, and I really do wish that there were more focused campaign Euro-style solo games like this. It reminds me, actually, not mechanically, but in terms of overall market 
uh, uh, market situation and focus of Under Falling Skies, which is also a solo game, which I'm very, very enthusiastic. Relatively low campaign overhead, relatively low rules overhead, but nonetheless a lot of variety and a lot of good mechanical trade-offs. So big recommendation for Legacy of You by Shem Phillips, published by Garpel Games 2023. Thanks to a very kind listener, Mark. I finally got to play Bus. This is designed by Jorn Duman and Joris Versenga. It's originally put out by Spotter Spiel, but Capstone Games did like a 28th anniversary. And it's, I want to say that one of their lighter games, it seems light, but all the action happens on the board. And there's cutting people off. There is, uh, you know, bushwhacking their, their, their buildings, there's cut, <laughs> cutting off their roots. All of this was, it was, was really fantastic. I loved every part of it. It has a little bit of fiddliness with action selections. If you ever play dominant species, it feels a little bit like this. You're putting these cylinders down the side row, and then after everyone's put down as many cylinders as they want, you then start doing those actions in order. But you're putting the cylinders in a, in a, in a certain order, and then you're always, uh, completing them from left to right. So, and then they have a weird sort of strength of each power. It depends on how many buses a single person has out. It's like the total bus strength. Yes. And that can go up in the middle of the turn because it's like the second thing you do or something. And so you sometimes you're either going very early and doing a lot of things because, you know, the A is at the start. Or you're going later and doing a lot of things because the A was at the end of that line. So it's very interesting sort of seeing how that works out. And then there are three sort of phases to the game. You either, either it's a bus game, so you're taking people on buses. They're either going to the office, or then they go to the pub, and then they go home. And you can play with that with the space time continuum. Yeah, because it's about it's the intersection of <clears throat> two very uh, trenchant elements of civic planning, namely public transportation and time travel. Exactly, goes together perfectly. Yeah. And this did go together perfectly because the very last turn of the game, there was tension. I'd gone to that space and it was sort of, because you don't have to do it. All of the other spaces, you sort of, if you have to put up three buildings, you have to. If you go to the time space thing, you stop time and you're delivering people to the same places. Or you decide, or no one goes there, or you decide not to stop time and it just moves to the next thing. So creating that tension made people completely change what they were going to do. And I put it there as my last placement. So it was a great wrench in the system. It was a threat. Do you know who's really good at bus? Cher. Cher, yes. If she could turn back time, she could find a way. Yikes. Yeah. So it's a very low scoring game because you try to set things up. People take your building spots. People cut you off. People take your passengers before you can get them. All of these things are great. I was so happy that I got a chance to play it. I'm looking forward to playing it a lot more. And that is Bus by Splatter Spiel. I think Bus was the second Splatter I'd ever played. I think, I, as I recall, Antiquity was the first one. I fell in love with Antiquity. I still love it. And Bus was the second one. Bus was one of those early foundational hobby experiences. This is before the release of uh, Food Chain Magnet, which, you know, for many people is, is, is the, the, the formative Splatter. It's the one that hit the most mainstream of all the releases, I think. And... It was one of those early formative experiences where I see it as like, this is brilliant, and it's causing me physical pain. It gave me a splitting headache, because you need to plan everything. It is one of those splatters where A has to come before B, which has to come before C. Oh, did you try to put C before B? Oh, no, nothing happens, you idiot. It's funny, because those type of games really usually set me off, but... But reading the rules and seeing how it was going to play out, you knew this was going to happen. There was no yes. getting around it. Well, any splatter game, you have to know that that's the way it's going to True. be. True. And just the fact that it's so low scoring that even even a sort of like a take that for one point is very meaningful. Yes, absolutely. I'm very interested to see if my attitude towards bus uh, will change. Having, you know, more fully internalized the design idiom of splatter and being more comfortable with that. Uh, or whether it just falls into the same category of the, oh, this is a spatial puzzle that I have no interest in. But uh, we'll, we'll absolutely see. Glad you enjoyed Bus. I got to play Battlecrest Metron Base Game. So, 
Battlecrest is a card battling game from Buttonshy Games. Buttonshy Games being the publisher that tends to release very minimalistic card games in adorable little wallets that are, that are little card wallet throwbacks from 20 to 30 years ago. The, the wallets, not the games themselves. And most of their designs are solitaire or solitaire friendly. And Battlecrest is a game with a solo mode. There's an additional deck, uh, small deck of cards, six that you need to do, sometimes additional rules for specific characters. And I've talked about Battlecrest before when it first came out. Uh, it continues with the publishing tradition of Button Shy Games. You can get the print and play for a very, very small quantity of money. And given that it's a small number of cards, it's not a complicated project to do. Or you can actually buy the physical copies, which also tend to be very cheap. And if the game is a success, or if they like it, it will be supported through lots of expansions. Battlecrest has three different base sets, and three different waves of expansion content. So there are different stages, and the stages actually, for what it's worth, for my money, is where the best variety can be found in terms of the overall effect of the match. Different characters, I'll always love different characters in a, in a sort of fa science fantasy type battle game like this, as well as new AI decks. Now, the two-player game, I think, is wonderful. It's a game of cat and mouse, a very simple but effective card activation system, whereby the available cards, as they get exhausted, that reduces your options, but simultaneously makes you more deadly until such time as you waste half your turn refreshing. And there's all, always this tension of saying, oh, I can really pull off this awesome combo. Ooh, but it's going to be so vulnerable next round. Do I, do I give up momentum and refresh all my cards, or do I really press the advantage? And I love tempo decisions like that. And this is one of the reasons why I find the solo mode for Battlecrest so utterly disappointing, because the AI character does not operate on that basis at all. The key element that I think fuels a lot of this tension is how defense works in Battlecrest. If you don't have any cards available, your defense is going to be zero, and so someone can wail on you doing a fair amount of damage. On the other hand, if you've got lots of cards available, your defense can, can be relatively high if you want to devote those resources. And so in addition to the tension, there's a little bit of double think about how much someone is willing to devote in terms of fending off your attacks. The AI, on the other hand, j seems to generate a relatively random quantity of defense every time you attack them. And so my normal decision-making process, not that I play Battlecrest all the time, I wish I could play it more often, was entirely undone, and my thought was, I just need to hit it as hard as I can to try to overcome some random defense threshold. And that was not nearly as interesting. And on top of that, it had an AI to execute that was probably about as complicated as the base game itself. Now, in the case of Battlecrest, it's a very, very straightforward game. The biggest problem in internalizing the Battlecrest rules is just how the information is presented. By virtue of their publishing model, there necessarily has to be two different little rule booklets of like eight pages each of tiny, tiny, tiny little pages. But merely by virtue of the fact that it's bifurcated, it ends up feeling more complicated than it actually is, because you're cross-referencing two, two different documents. But on top of that, there's the standard problem with AI mode prioritization, what it does in response to attacks, how it triggers attacks, what targets it's going to do, where it's going to move when it moves, etc., 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 etc. I was willing to go through the effort because of my enthusiasm for Battlecrest and a new wave recently got launched, and I picked up Wave 3 not too long ago. Uh, but I do not think I will be going back to Battlecrest solo ever again. This has, however, inspired me to get the actual two-player versus mode back to the table, just so I can play with all the new toys, and indeed experience the tension, the trade-offs, and the tempo considerations that the actual base design gives you. So that is Battlecrest. This specifically was the Metron base game designed by Dustin Dobson and Milan Zivkovic, published by Buttonshy Games. Lastly, from me, Mark, we got the G.I. Joe deck building game Rise of the Flag campaign expansion back to the table. This is designed by T.C. Uh, Petty III, put up by Renegade Games, much like the base game. And it's a fairly bog standard deck building game like Ascension. There's a row of cards in front of you that cycle and you improve your deck. What the campaign does is puts all these uh, fancy envelopes in the box and the back of the campaign book has all these logs that you you know turn turn to log three and read that and you know what's really good about that mark like the envelopes have much of the same cards right so it goes you know get mission cards from envelope two and there's mission cards in all of them so if there's like an errata <laughs> that, you know when you read oh, when you read no. when you read uh, uh, file five and it says get these cards from envelope three but it really means 
Envelope 2. Oh, no. Yeah, so that took a while to sort out. That's terrible. Yeah, yeah, it was really bad. Oh. So, anyway, that being said, it's still playing out just fine. Interesting stuff going on. Giant aircraft carrier with with fancy abilities and sort of... And, and Walker's being literal. There's a physical aircraft carrier that you construct out of out of card, cardboard. And so you strip out all the expansions. So you're sort of back to the base game with all sort of new cards being introduced over and over again. Pets. You get your pets now. Because, you know, it's not G.I. Joe unless, you know, you bring in a parrot. The only one, Yeah, the only pet I remember is the parrot. Wait, didn't one of the ninjas have a bird, uh, uh, another animal? And there was Junkyard Dog. Oh, yeah. And then, junk, yeah, right. And then if you watch uh, uh, Robot Chicken, there's a fantastic episode about G.I. Joe and the pets. Oh, okay. Anyway, that's G.I. Joe, the deck building game. Not much I can say about it. It's great. It's got the Cobra, and they do their, like, crazy, you know, over the top, trying to take over Earth with their missions, and, and the, the way each mission is different. Really interesting. Did you know that there's going to be a side-scrolling beat-em-up that's going to be released this year that is uh, G.I. Joe-themed? That's fantastic. Yeah, because we're in a, we're in a kind of a, a golden age of, of rejuvenation of the genre, and uh, I've seen some, some early footage. It looks impressive. Nice. And that's G.I. Joe, the deck-building game, Rise of the Flag campaign expansion. Finally, for me, you got to play Gloomhaven Buttons and Bugs. This is a review copy sent to us by Cephalfair Games, and I gotta say, honestly, I'll talk about the game later, but the mere fact of this game, of Buttons and Bugs, makes me very happy about the hobby. Because I think it's worth a little bit of a history lesson. Back in 2018, when Gloomhaven was first published, it was this weird little Kickstarter campaign that lost its fool mind. It's important to remember that before Gloomhaven was Gloomhaven, it was just this thing that raised a few hundred thousand dollars in Kickstarter. Now, granted, that's a lot of money. And even at the time, that was relatively large amount of money for board games, but that was not, you know, there, there had already been seven figure Kickstarters at the time. And then Gloomhaven was released and suddenly it was like, every, everyone was like, wait, what? And then the reprint got the seven figure Kickstarter that it had in the first place. And then there was a fan made version by Joe Clipful that reduced Gloomhaven to a single handed experience called, and I love this title, Gloomholden. A solo version that captured some of the mechanical intricacies of Gloomhaven, but nonetheless in a shrunk solitaire form, purely card-driven that you could do in one hand. And like Ouroboros eating its own tail, Cephalopera Games reached out to Glow Clipful, and that fan project inspired by Gloomhaven has now become an official Cephalopera Games project, Gloomhaven Buttons and Bugs. The theme is that your adventure has been shrunk down to a teeny little size. And now... You play a solo game that is kind of, sort of, but almost completely unlike Gloomhaven. And the scenario maps are just cards. The scenario deck consists of a whole bunch, you know, there's flavor text, there are items on the cards, and there's setups and, and the scenario instructions. But you just flip it over, that's the map. It's the back of a card walker. Do you know what else is fantastic, Mark? It's the box. It's, I Because the ratio dimensions are exactly like Gloomhaven. It looks just like Gloomhaven. So if you just, get it out yep. of scale, you, you have no idea Shrunk how Shrunk nice down to a teeny, I know, I know. I was hopeful, this is this is a very, very minor gripe, and it comes with these, like, one centimeter tall miniatures representing your character, and I was hopeful that this was going to be a one-to-one scale miniatures game. There have been a number of them in the past, usually on a tabletop scale, but no, sadly, it's, it's actually smaller than the actual scale, as I realized this when playing Scenario 3, where you, mild spoilers, are supposed to start fighting mice, and the mice are just these tiny cubes, they're not actually the size, okay, fine. So I guess it is actually still too small. I think that was a tiny bit of a missed opportunity, but anyway. So, it is very much like Gloomhaven in the sense that it is card-driven. You have these ability cards. You do the top half of one card, the bottom half of another card, and the classes are all different. You even have some notion of a modifier deck, and a modifier deck that gets that, that elaborates itself as you level up. Now, you don't have any control about how it elaborates itself, but that's fine. And combat is now dice-driven. There's always a good result, a bad result, and a neutral result, and you cycle through them on a relatively... De- the cycling is deterministic, but the result every time is random. That part, I think, is honestly brilliant. That's when it really shines and captures a lot of what made Gloomhaven interesting in the smaller package with lower rules overhead. The card cycling, though, I'm a little less optimistic about, because one of the cool things about Gloomhaven was there was really a solid sense of tempo. You know, there was the 
early abilities and you have to be careful about when to use the, the lose abilities. There are some abilities that you use it and the card goes away, which is a problem because card cycling is a representation of both your health and of your abilities. Gloomhold, <clears throat> Gloomhold and, uh, elaborated on that, and now Gloomhaven Buttons and Bugs further heightens that. You have four cards. No matter how many times you level up, you're always going to have four cards. Some of them get upgraded, and you're still just playing two cards per, and sometimes they come back flipped. That's That gives you a little bit more legs, but ultimately, you end up in a very, very, very tight race against time. Gloomhaven itself was a race against time, but Buttons and Bugs really narrows that to a fine point. And consequently, I feel like some of the nuance and some of the tempo has gone away. Uh, but those are the kind of prices you expect to pay. Are, are the items adorable like they should be? Like they're like acorn helmets? and Oh, yeah, they're and, exactly that. Yes. Oh, fantastic. Th- now, they're not represented graphically. They're just text. Oh. But that is, yeah, sorry. <laughs> but no, that is no exactly little, what No little illustrations? Oh. No, unfortunately not. I'm actually glad. I was afraid that the entire thing, especially based on the, on the title, was going to be overly cutesy. I'm not a big fan of cutesy. Uh, they, they've decided to keep the same tone of the original Gloomhaven of money-grubbing, desperate, hired killers, <laughs> okay. which I've kind of appreciated, and that's still very much the case. And I really like the fact that we're talking about a very low footprint 20-minute scenario game. That's one of the reasons why I've played three sessions already going through uh, my, my sort of quote-unquote campaign of Buttons and Bugs. And some scenarios are character class specific. The character differentiation is not to the same extent as of Gloomhaven, obviously, but nonetheless very impressive. And uh, I, I'm just really pleased with Buttons and Bugs as a project, as an evolution, as, tracing back its history and its lineage. It makes me very pleased to be a member of this glorious hobby, as well as the excellent representation in the cast and just the, the, the publication history. Does it capture everything that I love about Gloomhaven? Absolutely not. It really doesn't. But it has enough of the hints of the genius of the design of Gloomhaven that I'm very much appreciative of what uh, Buttons and Bugs manages to execute. And so I'm very interested in continuing. I'm probably going to be playing at least uh, a, a few more sessions of Buttons and Bugs. Uh, we'll see how long the campaign manages to keep my interest, because the writing in Gloomhaven, although I very much appreciated the tone, uh, it, it, it somewhat hit or miss in terms of the overall narrative, per se. We'll see how, how far it develops and see what Buttons and Bugs off- offers in the future. But for now, I'm very, very impressed with how much they've been able to distill and very pleased to be able to spend, you know, 20 minutes here, 20 minutes there. Just clear off a side of your desk. That's all the space you're going to need. Open up the teeny little box and and play a tiny little tactical adventure thing. Very impressive. This is a review copy sent to us by Cephalofair Games. Gloomhaven Buttons and Bugs was co-designed by Joe Clipful, who designed Gloomholden, and Nikki Valens, uh, whose work I'm always eager to, to see. They're a fascinating designer. And this is published this year pursuant to successful crowdfunding. That is Gloomhaven Buttons and Bugs. And those are the games we played this week. Let's take a brief break to pay some bills. And now on to the news and why it doesn't matter. So CGE, we like quite a few of their games. They've decided to go into the the actual manufacturing of board games. I believe most of their games were manufactured by Oren Carton, which uh, translates to East Cardboard. And so they've become a co-owner of this of this facility they they do puzzles and all sorts of other things so now they own their own uh, board game manufacturing factory vertical integration that's right although it, it it seems to not have worked for haba but they're working their way out of it i guess yeah it's weird i mean games workshop has been doing this for a long time and asmodee has uh, done a little bit of that, not in the manufacturing sense, but in the distribution sense. I mean, it, it, it's it's the natural endpoint of a lot of business planning to engage in vertical integration of some degree or another. We'll see how it works for them. Seismic Walker. I'm always disappointed when a crowdfunding project that is clearly the product of a lot of passion and has some design and thematic elements that show promise re- fails to reach fruition. I'm still very chagrined at the failure of Burned to fund. I hope that a relaunch happens uh, successfully at some point. And uh, Seismic was, uh, again, crowdfunded. There was a first attempt at Kickstarter that failed to reach the uh, results that the designer wanted. Uh, Seismic is going to be returning on GameFound sometime this summer, and I, for one, am looking forward to it. I saw this. I, too, am very excited. Mark, what's better than eating your board game? This is it. It's great. This is called Gummy Quest. Delicious 
fantasy gummies. You get 150 of these gummies, and they're all shaped in all different sizes. Like, you know, you got your heroes and your dice and your potions and your monsters. So all sorts of different variety of these gummies, and it is a Kickstarter that is out there. <laughs> and who knows? The gummies don't hold their shape. <laughs> who knows if there's a game involved? <laughs> You say, oh, I killed that goblin. So you grab the goblin, you eat it. And then, you know, the guy beside you says, that that was my warrior that you just ate. <laughs> and you're done. But anyway, I thought it was hilarious. Yep. Gummy Quest. Legacy Duh. games have you tear up cards, but that is for chumps. That is exactly. for people who cannot commit. If you really want to destroy board game components, you eat them. Just so. Macross news, Walker. There was. Macross news. It's true. Macross is going to be streaming on Disney+. Plus. Macross has been in a nightmare of rights distribution issues, and now almost all, a shocking amount, but not all, will be available streaming on Disney Plus soon. And so- soon everyone will be able to be exposed to the franchise that is captured by imagination for decades and say, what? What? I can't wait for the new stuff that they're going to put wait, out, Mark. What? Is this... Who can... Uh. Anyway... Uh, now, people might be wondering, I thought that this was a board game podcast. This is the board game jurisdictional hook. Are you ready? The original Battletech mechs were ripped off of Macross mechs, at, which is a reflection of the rights and intellectual property nightmares that led to the failure of distributing Macross all around the world that have now been resolved. That is your board game jurisdictional there hook. You go. Nailed it. Macrossed. So there's a new thing on game. I don't know if it's new, but it's it just is weird. Now you can just pre-order. Simon has a game found up called The Dead Keep, and it's, it. you know, maybe campaign games have not hit for you, but this is the one. <laughs> this is the campaign game that you need to pre-order on Game Found. Wow. Well, that seems like a good note on which to end it. It does. Thank you very much for joining us. We're sorry for this abbreviated episode. Don't worry, we will be more wrong in the future. If you want to get in touch with us, you can find all our contact information at sowronggames.com. We read everything you send us, and we'll get back to you if we can, if we survive the week, which is, as we say, doubtful. Six to five and pick them, as they say in Vegas. Thank you very much for joining us. We hope to see you again soon. Please do take care. Peace! <coughs> and remember, thank your rules explainer. You've been listening to So Very Wrong About Games, produced by Michael Walker and edited by Mark Bigney. Special thanks goes to What Does It Eat for generously allowing us to use their most excellent song, FOS, as our theme. You can find them at whatdoesiteat.com. You can reach us by email at soverywrongaboutgames at gmail.com or on Twitter at sowronggames. Thanks very much. See you next time, and always, try to be right, but remember you are so very wrong. <laughs>